I want you to give it up for our speaker. He traveled in from Dallas, Texas to be with us today. He's been here at this house many, many times. Would you give it up for Dr. Manny Arango as he comes to preach the word. Oh, come on, can we give some praise and glory and honor to the King of Kings, to the Lord of Lords. Come on, his name is Jesus. This is for the worshipers who don't need a worship team. Come on. God, I came to give your name praise. God, I love you. I worship you. Come on, I don't need anybody to hype me up. Come on, I don't need a song. God, I've got my own voice. I've got my own song. You've saved me from too much. You've rescued me. Oh, let's pray. Holy Spirit, we invite you into this moment. God, we thank you that your word says that where two or three are gathered in your name, there you are. So we don't have to beg you to be in the room. We don't, we don't have to beg over and over. God, you said, hey, if you praise me, worship me, I'm there. And so God, we thank you that if you're here, peace is here. If you're here, joy is here. If you're here, provision is here. If you're here, deliverance is here. Freedom is here. And most importantly, God, if you're here, salvation is here. A fresh start is here. And if you're here, revival is here. Oh, God, you are the one who turns dead things back to life. Before I even preach, I just want to prophesy right now. Man, I don't know what you've buried in your life because God never told Martha and Mary to bury Lazarus. So he, Jesus shows up on the scene with a very, very key question. Where'd you bury him? Where'd you bury him? They could have waited for Jesus to show up in order to actually bury him. But instead of operating by faith, they operated by custom. But we declare right now, maybe you've buried that marriage. We declare your marriage is coming back to life in the next couple of days. Maybe you buried a dream, it's coming back to life. Maybe you buried a business, it's coming back to life. We declare right now, come on, Lazarus is gonna come up out of the grave over the next couple of days. We speak that into the atmosphere. So God, we thank you that you're here. We thank you that you're moving. And Holy Spirit, we release you to do what only you can do. God, we don't want anybody leaving tonight saying, man, that guest speaker did a good job. We want everyone to leave saying the Holy Ghost spoke to me in a real way. God, would you do uh, what you do so good? Uh, change perspectives, soften hearts, open eyes, open ears, and make the preaching of the gospel easy. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Come on, and we all said together, amen, amen, amen. Come on, you can high five your neighbor as you sit down. Tell them they look good even if they don't. We speak those things that be not as though they were at North Church. Uh, I'm so excited to be with you guys. Man, who's just excited that there's some churches that do this on a Thursday night? Come on, it can go down at any time. I'm honored. I actually have lost count of how many times I've been here. I think this is the fifth time. I think I did a youth event one time. I've done a Sunday for you. I've done revival twice. I think this is my fifth time. I, I think I'm family, okay? I think, is this six? Number six? I'm missing one. Okay, this is my sixth time at North Church. And man, the church is growing. This is amazing. And uh, I'm super, super honored. Hey, for those of you who may be new, if you're wondering, who is that handsome black man? I don't know who that is. Uh, 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 if you're new here, it, uh, uh, maybe you've joined recently. Uh, your pastor introduced me. Uh, I, this is my sixth time preaching, but this is my first time preaching here as Dr. Manny Arango. All right. Um, so over the last four years, I was in school getting my doctorate. When God asked me to dedicate this portion of my life to studying, I didn't even have a master's degree, y'all. And so uh, I spent two years getting a master's degree, four years getting my doctorate. So I've been on a six-year journey uh, to become Dr. Manny Arango. But really, I'd love to give you context for that. Uh, because it's easy to celebrate the end of something. And so June 8th, I, I graduated with my doctorate. So I've been a doctor for about a month and a half, okay? Uh, I'm, I'm super excited. Um, 
uh, my, my degrees in uh, theology and biblical studies. And so here, here's the context, okay? My father was incarcerated for 18 years. Uh, my father immigrated to this country from Cuba. Uh, took me to, uh, when my father immigrated to this country, uh, my dad started selling drugs for his uncle. My father started using drugs recreationally. My father started abusing drugs and then took me to a crack house for the first time when I was five years old. On my mother's side of the family, my mother was pregnant by the age of 12 years old with my older sister. Uh, gave birth at 13, pregnant again at 14 with my older brother, gave birth at 15 years old. Five of my uncles are alcoholics and three of my aunts are prostitutes. Okay, I've met all of my cousins through glass because they were incarcerated when I met them. I am the first Arango in history with a bachelor's degree. I'm the first Arango with a master's degree. And on June 8th, 2024, about two months ago, I became the first Arango in history with a doctorate. Come on, I'm the first Arango to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm the first Orango to be baptized in fire and in water. I'm the first Orango to look every generational curse in its face and declare if God has blessed me, nobody can curse me. My mama can't curse me. My father can't curse me. My grandmama can't curse me. My ancestors can't curse me. I'm blessed. I'm going to preach it like I feel it. I'm blessed in the city. I'm blessed in the field. I'm blessed when I come. I'm blessed when I go. I am blessed. I need you to get this because the blessing is not something that happens to me. Uh oh. Blessing is not a season I walk in. Is that up? I'm having a good day. I'm blessed. No, blessed is an identity I adopt. I am blessed. My day may be rough, but I'm blessed. We going through some drama, but I'm blessed. It's an election year, but we blessed. Hello, no matter who wins, we blessed. I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. And nobody can curse me. And nobody can close doors that God's opened for me. And nobody can put a hex on me. Here, here's my, my aggravation, Pastor Rodney. This is just a little, this is me on my soapbox, okay? It's Christians who use good teaching about generational curses to stay cursed. Why would you quote the Bible to use the Bible as an excuse to stay stuck in toxic cycles. No, we acknowledge generational curses so that we can then say, even though the enemy attacked me on every side, even though I come from the most dysfunctional family imaginable, even though my father was in car, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Oh yes, it can. Even though the attack came the weapon was formed, but it didn't prosper. Come on, we declare over your life today, let my life be a living testament that God can do anything with anybody from anywhere because he is everything and he is more than enough. We declare over your life, I don't know if your mama was anxious or your grandfather was depressed or an alcoholic or incarcerated. No, when you come into a relationship with Jesus, Jesus gives you, the, gives you the exact same invitation that he gave Nicodemus. You can be born again. Born again. Which means we were all born jacked up the first time. Come on. Well, nobody born right the first time. We was all born into Adam the first time, but God does not judge any of us based on our first birth. He judges us based on our rebirth, which is why pastor would get up here and I mean, and persuade you and push you to get baptized. Why do we want you to get baptized? Because baptism is a symbolic representation of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. We want you to get baptized because when you come up out of that water, you're not cursed. Come on, you're blessed. When you come out of that water, we're declaring you're a new creation in Christ. The old has gone and the new has come. When you come up out of that water, you're going to stop dating dummies. Hello. <laughs> but we declare prophetically old mindsets are going to die in the, in the water. Come on, old habits, old systems of thinking. And so if you're in the room tonight, come on, don't let another revival happen and you not decide, I'm getting baptized this time. Don't use excuses. We got everything you need for you to get baptized. I remember the first time, the first, the first time I, I got baptized, I did get baptized the second time because we went to Israel and I thought, well, this is where Jesus got baptized, so we're just going to do this again, okay? 
Um, but I remember the first time I got baptized. I, I promise you, I believe that generational curses broke off in my life when I got baptized. I think baptism is powerful. All right, come on. We got to get to the message. I got 30 minutes. And uh, I make this agreement with y'all every time I come, okay? Uh, we, just go on, we just meet in the middle, okay? Because this is a diverse room. This, this is actually one of the most diverse churches that I preach at. There's a whole lot of folks in the room. Come on. I love this. This is amazing. Um, but not all of us woke up black this morning. There's a lot of us that did. There's, I see a lot of black folks in here. This is amazing, okay? But not all of us woke up black, okay? But I don't care how you woke up this morning. You black right now. Okay, you black now. Okay, right now, you black. Okay, and uh, I call this Cinderella black because it lasts till midnight. Okay, you black till midnight. Um, and so I don't know what you wanted to ever do. You know what I'm saying? You, you use your blackness to your discretion. Okay, I don't know if you wanted to dunk or dance or something, whatever you want to do, you do that. But once 1201 hits, it's over. Okay, you back to whatever you woke up as this morning. Okay. But uh, for the next 30 minutes, I need your best black energy. I need you to holler back at me, okay? I need this to feel like a black church, okay? So you say amen, you holler back at me. Uh, I preach better when you talk to me, Garrett, okay? I, t I preach better, all right? And so, but here we go. This is an agreement, okay? As long as you promise to act as black as possible. I will, there we come on, there we go, there we go. As long as you promise to act as black as possible, I will act as white as possible, and we will get out of church on time. Okay. Because the church I grew up at didn't have no timer. We didn't have no clock. We just had church. We had church until there was no more church to have, okay? So, um, especially revival. Revival just meant till midnight. We wasn't black till midnight. We church till midnight, okay? Uh, but we're not going to do that today, okay? So I'm going to do this in 30 minutes. Uh, as long as you holler at me, okay? Uh, if you got a Bible, go to John. Go to the book of John. Go to John chapter 2. Uh, go to John chapter 2. Uh, anybody love Pastor Rodney and Pastor Shannon? I know I do. Um, thank you for being faithful. Thank you for just being an amazing mentor and, and a voice in my life. Every time I get a text from you, I'm happy. Literally, every time. I've never got a text from you and been like, ah, oh, what's Pastor Rodney want? Nope. Every time. Actually, every time he texts me and asks me to speak, I say yes first, then check the calendar second. Um, and I don't do that with a lot of churches, uh, but I do it with this church. And it, it is because you have amazing pastors and amazing leaders. Thank you for just the, the, the moments we've spent in your office are moments I will never forget. Um, and uh, I love this church, and I love you guys uh, so much, so much. Um, okay, let's go to John 2. Let's go to John 2. Um, so I got news for you tonight. I changed my message as worship started, okay? Uh, uh, so, if it's good, the Holy Ghost gets the credit. If it's bad, it's my fault, okay? Uh, but but can, we, can we just cook something? Can we, can we just cook something? Like, I, 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 I'm taking a risk. I'm, literally, we were praying up in the office, and I just felt a little, a little nudge that we're, we're supposed to change sermons. I don't like it when the Holy Ghost does that to me, I like it when he tells me like a week in advance, you know what I'm saying? But come on, how many people know? Like we gotta flow, we gotta flow with it. And so um, I, I pray, I pray, Lord God, let this be for somebody in the room tonight, okay? Let's go to John 2, we're gonna start reading at verse one. John 2, um, I've got it on my iPad, it's up on the screens. Um, John chapter two, uh, if there's a word that I don't say, you can just say the word that I don't say. Um, on the third day, the third day, everybody say third day. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mama was there. Uh, and Jesus and his disciples had been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mama said to him, They have no more wine. Okay? They ain't got no more wine. This is a problem. Okay? They are now set up for massive social embarrassment. You can't have a wedding with no wine. A wine, as we're going to learn later on in the New Testament, is going to be a symbol, a sign for the blood of the new covenant, okay? Wine represents joy. It represents peace. It represents celebration. Come on. You don't drink with your enemies? Well, we don't drink at all, but you know. <laughs> help, help us hold the go. Some of y'all was like, I still drink. <laughs> That's why you need to get baptized. 
<laughs> that needs to die. <laughs> anyway, okay, okay. <laughs> oh, uh, get this. They have no more wine. Verse four. Woman, see. <laughs> this is how I know Mary wasn't black, okay? Because Jesus would have died right here. Okay, if this was a black mama, Jesus would have died right here. This, 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 Jesus, they ain't got no more wine. Woman, bow, done. That would have been, that would have been it. That would, the, the Gospel of John would be two chapters. <laughs> and then Mary killed Jesus and atoned for our sins, okay? Okay, woman, get this. Why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. I don't, I don't want to twist the scriptures. I, I spent too long getting a doctorate to twist the scriptures and take them out of context. I think it's fair to say, Jesus says no. This sounds as pretty close as a no as I can get. That woman, why do you involve me? <laughs> this ain't none of my business. Do I look like the father of the bride? Okay, I'm not responsible for the wine in this scenario. Why is it that you involve me? This is a rhetorical question. And the way that we should interpret this rhetorical question is, this ain't none of my business. This ain't got nothing to do with me. And also, why do you even know, Mary? How do you know that there's no more wine at this wedding, okay? You, you're just being nosy, okay? Who can I preach this? I, I gotta preach this. Because Jesus does not call her woman to disrespect her. Jesus calls her woman to hearken back to the first woman because whereas Eve pushed Adam into his first sin, Mary is about to push Jesus into his first miracle. I wonder are there any husbands in the room when you didn't think you could start the business, there was a woman who nudged you. Oh, come on. I wonder is there any sons in the room who when you didn't think you could get accepted to that school, you had a mama who pushed you. I, I wonder has there ever been a woman in your life who you had a whole bunch of excuses as to why it wasn't the right time and why you weren't the right person, but you had a grandmama, a mama, a wife, a sister, a woman, somebody to push you into greatness. So woman is not here as a denigrating term. Jesus would never disrespect his mama. Come on, let's be real. Woman, why do you involve me? Um, uh, this ain't got nothing to do with me. And get this, get this. My hour has not yet come. I love this because Mary now has a choice to make. And we all have a choice to make when we hear a no from God. Oh, come on, don't act like you've always heard a yes from God. And Mary's not even being selfish. She's not even asking for something for herself. She's asking for a noble thing for somebody else. And Jesus has the audacity to say, why do you involve me? This is none of my business and my hour has not yet come. Now this is where a lot of us would take our seat at table number 14. Girl, I tried. Oh, I'm gonna I'm step on your toes. Don't act like you've never been a I tried Christian. I tried. I, tr I asked him. I tried. I gave just enough effort so that I don't feel guilty that I didn't try that hard. I tried just enough. Are you filled with the power of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues? I tried. Come on, this is for all the millennials. You own a home yet? We tried. Okay. When you gonna stop trying, when you gonna start doing? When you gonna stop trying, and when you gonna, gonna go, I'm not gonna let you go until you bless me. I'm not here to try. I'm here to get a breakthrough. I'm not here to try. I'm here to knock on heaven's door. I'm not here to try. I'm here to put a demand on heaven's supply. I'm not here to try. I came here with my mind made up. I'm getting baptized tonight. I'm getting free tonight. I'm getting delivered tonight. Something's gonna change in in my life, I came with some faith and some expectation. Get this, Jesus effectively says, 
No! Mary! No! Pastor Rodney, th- this next part is, is, is what don't make no sense. Jesus, they got a problem. They, they ain't no more wine at the wedding. This wedding, and you brought all your little disciples? Look at Judas over there drinking a bottle of wine. Just... Something weird with him. Don't trust him. He don't... This ain't got nothing to do with me. My hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. No. Here's Mary now with a choice to make. I could go take my seat at table number 14 and just go, I tried. But this is what Mary does. Pookie, Ray Ray, what y'all doing? (laughs) I'm black, I'm sorry. I can't turn it off. Pookie, Ray Ray, what y'all doing? Nothing, Mary. We just work at weddings on the weekends, making some extra money. Okay, follow me. Do whatever my son tells you to do. Can you imagine me and Jesus? I did not, I did not ask for servants. I told you no. But I have this thing called just in case faith. Jesus, I know you said no, but I came with some servants just in case you change your mind. Just in case you decide to do what I've asked you to do, I've got some servants ready for you. I've got just in case faith. See, 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 I want to teach this. Before I get ahead of my, I don't want to preach this, I want to teach this. Mm. Because we think the opposite of faith is fear. The opposite of faith ain't fear. The opposite of faith is sure. Certainty. You know what you want from God? A guarantee. Jesus, there ain't no more wine. Okay, if you go get me some servants and go get me some jars, I'll do you a miracle. And you're waiting on clear instructions from God. But how many people know that sometimes what Jesus means is different than what Jesus said? Sometimes Jesus will say no to test how bad you really want the thing you're asking him for. Sometimes Jesus will say no, but he don't mean no. He said no, but what he means is try a little harder. Push a little harder. He said no, but what he means is press a little bit. What he said is no, but what he meant is turn your plate down and fast about it. What he said is no. No, but what he meant is I want to see you flex your faith muscle. What he said is no. Ooh, but when you got ears of faith, you hear no a little different than everybody else hears no. Everybody else hears no and hears rejection. Everybody else hears no and gets depressed. But baby, you hear no and you hear no as an invitation to try again. You hear no and you go, it's time to ask, it's time to seek, it's time to knock. You hear no and you don't hear no like a normal person. You hear no with the ears of faith. Here we go, here we go, here we go. I'll make it plain. I call this single guy on a Christian college campus faith. (laughs) I was once upon a time a single guy on a Christian college campus. When I met my wife, um, I met my wife. It was a funny story how I met my wife. When I met my wife, I had a study group to go to. We had to go to chapel. We had required chapel service, and I had a study group afterwards. I rolled up on her. We was in chapel service together, and it was a required chapel service, so they didn't have to make it good. And so, you know, it was a little dry. And so, but, but, whoo, I felt faith in the room. I was like, hey, hey, um, I said to, to my wife, she was just, she was a stranger at the time. This is how I met her. I said, hey, my phone is dead, and I got a study group that I got to meet up with afterwards. Can I use your phone to text them? She said, yeah, you can use my phone. I, I, took out her, her, I took her phone and I texted myself. I texted me and, and here's the message. I said, I said, dang boy, you are so handsome. You are so fine. 
I typically let men pursue me, but I cannot contain myself. I, I must go out with you. Can we go out together? I gave her her phone back. I pulled out my phone, which was not dead. And I text her back. I said, dang girl, you bold. But I like a woman who knows what she wants. I said, here we go. I said, Friday or Saturday? Question mark. She saw both text messages. She looked at me, she smiled. Every dude in the room knows. Once you see teeth, it's over. We in there. <laughs> if I made you smile, <laughs> you, you, it don't matter. Nothing else matters. If you smiling, I got a shot. She said, we, we can't do Friday or Saturday. I got a boyfriend. I got years of faith though. I hit her with this question. Do you believe in the Bible? She said, yeah, I believe in the Bible. I said, in the Bible, there's betrothed, married, and divorced. Is your boyfriend in any of those categories? She said, no. I said, so Friday or Saturday? She said, I don't think you heard me. I said, I did hear you. I heard you perfectly clear. Your boyfriend is not in a covenant with you. Y'all are not married. I don't see no ring on your finger. Friday or Saturday? She said, you a little pushy. I said, I came here and I know exactly what I want from the Lord. Friday or Saturday? You telling me about your boyfriend is not about to stop me from getting my wife today. Friday? or Saturday. That's my wife today. That girl mine, this ring on my finger is because we in a covenant. At some point when God says no, you just gotta go, Friday or Saturday. What does this have to do with me? Why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. Come here, come here. What y'all doing? Nothing? Come here. Do whatever he tells you to do. Because I'm able to read in between the lines. And I heard you with faith. Two people can hear the same thing and have completely different responses. Two people can both go to the doctor and both get the same negative diagnosis and one person leave and say, this will not end in death. And another person leave and saying, I've lost all hope. They've heard the exact same thing, but one person heard with faith and one person heard with fear. You can hear the exact same thing. We could be in the exact same service and God say to everybody in the room, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. And half of us will go get some jars and some servants and prepare like he said yes even though he said no and the other half will soak and get depressed and get in despair and I came to decide today I'm going to be the half of the room that goes and prepares like God said yes because every no is a divine invitation everybody hears no if you can't hear a no you don't got real faith everybody hears no no ain't going to stop me. No will not deter me. Get this, get this, get this. My hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. Mary is the wrong person to say that to. This ain't the right time. Ain't the right time. Well, when I was 12 and an angel popped up in my living room, in the middle of my engagement to be married to Joseph and told me that I was gonna get pregnant with you. That wasn't a good time. Jesus, I didn't think my hour had come. Here we go, here we go. Let's, let's think about this logically. Let's think about this logically. Jesus says no, but then does yes. He gets the jars, says fill them with water. Since I got some servants, I mean, it was used as servants. Okay, fill, fill the jars with water. Okay, then he, he transforms the water into wine. So he says no, no, but then does yes. I don't know if this is confusing to anybody else. We're just reading the Bible. He says no, but then acts yes. No, yes. How does 
Jesus go from no to yes? Well, there's a couple logical conclusions. Okay, logical conclusion number one. We just do this by process of elimination. Logical conclusion number one. He said no, but he was really wrong. See, you don't like that one. I felt it tense up. You don't like that. Okay, he said no, but then Peter or somebody handed him the scroll of Isaiah. And he was like, okay, let me just do some research real quick. He's like, actually, yep, my time is good. Yep, I'm going to calculate the time. Yep, we're good. Sorry, Mary. I can do the miracle now. So he was wrong. So he changed his answer because he was wrong when he gave the first answer. Why don't we like that answer? You don't like that answer because you know Jesus is omniscient. He knows everything. So he's not wrong. He didn't change his answer because he was wrong the first time. Nope. Okay, logical conclusion number three. He was right, but he just obeyed God. You, you hate that one. You immediately, you're like, mm, nope. I ain't even gonna say amen. Nope, nope. Why do we know that's not true? Because the Bible tells us he submitted to the Father. He surrendered his will to the Father. He says, I can only do what I saw my Father do. He says in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but your will be done. So we already know Jesus is not wrong because he's omniscient. Jesus is not uh, right, but disobedient because he knows he never disobeys God. Logical conclusion number three. Here we go. What we do in our relationship with Jesus has an actual effect on Jesus. Logical conclusion number three, that what we bind on earth can be bound in heaven and what you loose on earth can be loose in heaven. That you are not in a simulation with Jesus. That you are in an actual dynamic relationship with Jesus. That your prayers matter. That your actions matter. That words of faith matter. That declarations of faith matter. That preparing for the miraculous can actually move the hand of God. That is the only logical conclusion to why Jesus could say no, but then do yes, because Mary makes a decision. I ain't taking no for an answer. Now, see, why, why are we uncomfortable with this? I'm going to tell you exactly why we're uncomfortable with this. Uh-oh, I hope I don't lose you. Because effectively, theologically, most of us are Calvinists. Now that's a $2,500 word, you may not even know what that means. It means that we believe everything's predestined. It's all fixed. God's just gonna do whatever God's gonna do. And when you live that way, it robs you of faith. Because essentially, you really believe Whatever God's going to do, he's going to do it, and I can't change his mind, and I can't do anything about it, and whatever he's going to do, I'm going to do it, and you walk around doomed. And here's what I'm saying. You can't manipulate God. You can't manipulate him, but you know what you can do? You can totally read in between the lines and go, I don't think you're really saying no. I think you are inviting me on a process that will transform me and the water. I think you are inviting me on a process that is going to change the desires of my heart and change this circumstance because you are not my genie. You are my God. You don't just want to do magic tricks. You want to disciple me and change me. You want to transform me. You want me to get out of my comfort zone. You want me to hear you differently. You want me to start to discern what you mean. You want me to pray. You want me to fast. You, you don't want me to just pray because it'll change your mind. You want me to pray because you want me to be in an intimate, close relationship. That, that's why you want me to pray. Because without relationship, you'll never know the difference between what he meant and what he said. You'll never know. Did he really mean no? Or was he testing me? Did he really mean no? Well, let me help you. God, I think that man's my husband, but he's already married. That's actually a no. God, you want me to smoke that weed? No. That's a no that ain't never gonna change. That's just no. But outside of sinful things, 
There's all this stuff that is only accessed by your faith, by your persistence, by your determination, and by your intimacy with a God who you're able to discern. He didn't just say no to dismiss me. He said no to draw me closer. He said no so that I would press in to his presence. He said no, and I didn't hear a no. I heard an invitation. Get this. Okay, here we go. Is the Holy Ghost talking to anybody? Can I ask you a hard question? What are the things you've asked God for and you feel like he said no, and then you just went back to your table. Then there's another group of us. Uh-oh. You're not the go sit at your table people. You're the micromanage the miracle people. Because now Jesus gets some jars, and he fills it with water. And here we go. We got a whole bunch of people who are like, what's, what? Jesus, we don't need water. We need wine. Well, Mr. Expert, if you knew how to get wine, you would have done it yourself. He, what, what, what are them jars for? Not only do you want God to give you a promise, you want Amazon level. It's going to arrive between the hours of 10 and 2. It's on the street. My wife will walk outside like, I'm like, where are you going? She's like, oh, my Amazon package is here. How did you know? Oh, I'm seeing the driver drive down the street. I'm sorry. Miracles don't come with tracking devices. At some point, when you have prepared, you got servants, you got jars. Let me go take my seat. Because I can't micromanage what you're about to do. And what you're about to do exceeds my level of expertise and understanding. I've left this in your hands, but I have prepared. I have prepared. I have prepared. I know this is hard, but in the middle of me and my wife walking through an infertility journey, when doctors told us we would never get pregnant, I remember being in an office with a doctor who said we would never get pregnant. The doctor left the room. I squeezed my wife's hand, and I said, the Holy Ghost just convicted me. The Holy Ghost just said to me, how dare you think you're waiting on me? I'm waiting on you. Oh, I need to help. I need, to, I need you to help. I need you to get this. Because so many of us, we just think we're waiting on a miracle from God. And we're frustrated with God. Can I be honest? I was frustrated with God. Can I be real, real? I was frustrated with God because my ratchet cousin named Apple got pregnant four times. Oh, I can't be real. Is that too hood for y'all? Grandmama got custody of all her kids. Keep getting pregnant. Meanwhile, me, I pay my taxes, I got a job. I love Jesus, and we can't get pregnant, and I'm mad with God. I'm frustrated with God. I'm annoyed because I'm just waiting and waiting and waiting, and I know I'm going to be a good father, and I know my wife is going to be a good mom, and I know we've broken generational curses, and I know I can steward this blessing, but God, why have you kept saying no? The doctors are saying no. The medical report says no. It feels like you're saying no. It feels like everybody around us is saying no, and I'm not preaching this passage from here. I'm preaching this from here, because in the middle of God saying no, God looked at me and said, you think you're waiting on me. I'm waiting on you. Why would I give you babies? You live in an 800 square foot apartment. You need to go prepare like I said yes. So we went right back to the loan officer who had told us no two years ago and we bought a house that was more square footage than we needed and I turned that room upstairs on the left into my prayer room. Bought a crib. Put it in that faith room. Bought a, bought a diaper genie. Put it in that faith room. Prepared for my miracle in the middle of God, me feeling like God was saying no. How dare you take no for an answer? Can I help you? I remember God giving me the revelation. I didn't make whales and sharks and then go, uh oh, where am I put this? He 
He makes the sea first. He makes the ocean first, then fills it. He didn't make birds and then go, where am I going to put them? No, he makes the sky first, then fills it. He doesn't make animals and add them and then go, where am I going to put y'all? No, he makes the land first, then fills it. We asking God to fill stuff and you ain't even formed nothing. God, I want to give you stuff to fill. God, I'll give you my life. Fill me. God, I'll give you a building. Fill it. God, we'll put more chairs out than we need. God, just fill it. God, I'll do what you want. God, I'll prepare. I'll stretch out my tent pegs. I'll enlarge my territory. Prepare. God's not asking you, are you ready? He's asking, are you prepared? It don't matter if you're ready. Ready's a feeling. I didn't feel ready, but I bought that house. I'm preparing. Get this? Just in case we get pregnant. Just in case we get pregnant, we got a place to bring that baby. Just in case you change your mind, you got servants to do whatever you need. Just in case you decide that today is a day that you turn water into wine, you got the jars you need, you got the water you need, you got the servants you need, because I have prepared for this miracle. Stop just wishing. Start preparing. Preparing. Here we go. Let's close. Are you getting anything out of this? I need you to move from hoping and wishing to actively preparing. I'm going to prepare. I'm going to prepare. I'm going to prepare my heart. I'm going to prepare my emotions. I'm going to prepare my space. I'm going to prepare buildings. God, I'm going to prepare. I'm going to prepare. I'm preparing for revival. I'm preparing for growth. I'm preparing. Come on, single people. My life can't look single and me say, I'm preparing for a husband or a wife. You may want to stop playing video games now, bro. Just saying. You may want to get accountable now. You, don't just hope. Oh yeah, I just want a wife. No, you're not prepared. You are completely unprepared for the thing that God would love to bless you with. But the Bible says that his blessing addeth no sorrow. So if he were to bless you in your unprepared state, then it would actually cause chaos in that blessing in your life. Prepared, prepared, but it takes faith to prepare. It takes faith to prepare as if he said yes, even though when it really feels like he's saying no. I know how it feels to feel like he's saying no. I know how it feels. I feel like every door just feels like it's closing. Every opportunity just feels like it's not working. God, here's my prayer. Give me discernment. God, if you really mean no, take the desire from me. But God, maybe, just maybe, your no is really an invitation to draw closer, to do something I'm uncomfortable with, to take risks that don't make any real sense, but make a whole lot of godly sense. Man, I... Here we go. Let's get to the bottom of the passage. They take the wine to the master of the banquet. The master of the banquet is befuddled. He goes, people don't typically bring out the best wine this late in the game. They bring out the good wine first, and then once people's sensibilities have been lost, <laughs> once they've turned up, then we bring out the cheap wine because they can't really distinguish. But you, you saved the best till last. Oh, you, you, you've reserved the best stuff for now, God, I wanted you to do this five years ago, 10 years ago, but you've saved the best till now. This is interesting because if you think about it, the whole story is really about time. 
This wedding happens on the third day. Jesus says, my hour has not yet come. It really wasn't a convenient time for Mary either. This, this whole thing is about time. Then, get this, I'm a nerd. It takes at least nine months to get wine. From the time that you thresh grapes and harvest grapes and ferment grapes. It takes about nine months minimum. It could be a year and a half maximum. Jesus does in minutes what it should take months to do. Um, we prophesy accelerated growth over your life. What should take 10 years, God's going to begin to just accelerate your time. So this whole thing's about time. And then the master of the banquet says, you saved the best until now. It's funny because when I got married to my awesome wife, thank God she didn't marry that other guy. But she's a blessing to my life. One of the first questions she asked was, when's the last time you like went to the doctor? And you know, I'm a typical guy. I was like, in middle school? I don't know. But she said, all right. This is why married men live longer, by the way. Like statistically, this is true. Married men live longer. She said, okay, I'm going to make a doctor appointment for you. You, you, you got to go to the doctor. I said, yeah, sure. You're the boss, whatever you need me to do. So my wife makes a doctor's appointment for me and she sits me down, Pastor Rodney, and she says, hey, your doctor's appointment is Tuesday at nine o'clock in the morning. She said, and you've never been to this doctor before. You really need to show up at like 8.45, 8.50. I said, yes, boss, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. Tuesday rolled around. I got out the shower at nine. <laughs> Don't judge me. I rolled to the doctor around 9.20. Now I was proud of myself. I'm still in the nine o'clock hour. So I go to the front desk and I'm like, hey, I got an appointment. My last name's Arango. I have an appointment for nine o'clock. And the lady looked at me and she said, I don't have an appointment in here for an Emmanuel Arango at nine o'clock. I said, ma'am, you need to at least give me a doctor's note because my wife <laughs> needs confirmation that I came here, okay? She said, she had a little attitude. She said, I don't give doctor's notes to adults for their wife. I was like, you need to change your attitude, okay? I said, ma'am, I don't know what to do. She said, there's no appointment in here for Emmanuel Rango for nine o'clock. I said, ma'am, I, I don't know what to do. She said, you know, we're doing this like a 10 minute exchange, me and this lady. And she says, you know what? I'm just gonna search your name without the time. And she said, yep, you're here. There's a 10 o'clock appointment for you. <laughs> Emmanuel Rango, 10 a.m. And that is the day I realized my wife is way smarter than me. She is playing chess, I am playing checkers. This, that was the day I realized, oh yeah, I'm, I'm toast. I, I. She wasn't gonna argue with me. If my wife, who's human, is able to calculate all of my failure and make sure I get where I'm supposed to be on time, you think it's Mary that set up the wedding? Oh, it wasn't Mary. You think it's Mary that made sure it was on the third day? Oh, it wasn't Mary. You think it's Mary that made sure that the symbol of the covenant was there while two people were getting, oh, it was not Mary. The one who stands outside of time said there's going to be a wedding in Cana and that's going to be the place where my son is going to reveal his glory. The one who's outside of time sets things up in time and saves the best till last. We declare today the stuff you think you're late for, you're early for. The stuff you thought I should have been married by now, God says I'm preparing something for you that eyes have not seen, that ears have not heard. You just got to believe that you're on time, you're on schedule. The steps of the righteous man are ordered by God and that you are operating according to his time, to his schedule. Can I be clear? Jesus is playing chess. He knew we would struggle with infertility before we even saw a doctor. I remember one time I'm frustrated about not getting pregnant and the Holy Ghost says to me, had I gotten, who I feel this is for somebody. Had I given Elizabeth and Zechariah 
what they wanted for when they wanted it. John the Baptist would have been too old to be the forerunner for Jesus' ministry. There's stuff you want, but the architect of the universe is actually the one who's there at the wedding. And it is not you who's prompting a conversation with him. He has set up every detail of this wedding to get faith out of you and belief out of you and trust out of you. You are right on time, right on time. And we declare over your life that your latter season is going to be better than your former season. Stop dreaming. Stop thinking about the stuff behind you and start dreaming about the stuff in front of you. This next decade is going to blow your mind. God's just getting started with this church. He's just getting started with you. Who's that for? There's stuff you've been praying for for a long time. And God is reassuring you, I saved the best till last. The thing you want from me, it's on the way. I remember the Holy Spirit telling me, I've already chosen your son's friends. You don't think I know the exact year, the date, the hour, the minute he's going to be born? I just need you to participate with me on this journey of faith. I need you to respond appropriately. The only thing that's going to prolong this is you being frustrated and not hearing me with the ears of faith. Who's that for? You're saying, you know what, Pastor Manny? You're talking to me. You're preaching to me. Come on. Faith is coming back. Faith. God, you're reviving my faith. You're, you're bringing my faith back. If that's you, just wave your hands. God, we declare. Come on, all over the room. We ask that faith would come on online. Come on. We stick jumper cables to your faith. Right now, we declare faith is coming back. Right now at our location. Come on. At our Guthrie location. Pastor Hetty's going to get up on stage and going to lead that location and an altar call and the prayer team here, you can come on down and I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for this location and for our Guthrie location. Come on. We declare right now by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, God is about to usher you into the next season of your life. He's going to accelerate growth. God's had you in slow. He's had you waiting, but God, would you switch it around in a moment? God, would you have a moment where you transform things in our life in what seems like it's moving real slow? Would it start moving real fast? God, would you prepare us to be prepared? God, would you do it? God, do it supernaturally. God, enlarge our territory. God, we ask that the word that we heard tonight wouldn't just be emotional, that we wouldn't just respond in a way that's based in a feeling, but we would make a decision. I know exactly what I need to do. As soon as the service is over, I'm going to go prepare and I'm going to start using my faith muscles. Come on, we declare that in Jesus' name and we say amen, 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 amen. Come on, if you need prayer, come on, get down here.